Welcome to another episode of the Successful Mind Podcast. Today, uh, my guest is Gary McIntosh from uh, Operation Underground Railroad. And uh, I've been promising that this pot this podcast would would come out soon. We wanted to talk about the horrors of sex trafficking in the United States and around the world, which I am really new to, by the way. Um, I've just gotten uh, involved with your organization, Gary, and which I'm very proud to be uh, uh, part of, of being able to contribute the best that I possibly can. And I really would like you to tell our listeners what this is actually about and what's happening in our world when it comes to uh, slavery and uh, child sex slavery. Because I have to say, even though I knew it existed, I had no idea the numbers and the atrocities that were actually happening around the world. Yeah, absolutely. And and it sounds like we're just jumping jumping right in, David. I we're mean, just usually, jumping yeah. in, man. That's how I go. That's, that's usually my... I preface by saying, you know, this is uh, this is a dark topic because it is. And, and uh, operators are encountering the things that our survivors are experiencing are, are in my opinion, just pure evil. Um, Operation Underground Railroad. So we exist to rescue and rehabilitate children from from sex trafficking, and we've been at it for about seven years. Just to kind of paint a little picture of, of the, the scope of the problem, you know, what it is that, that we're tackling, there's uh, estimated 30 to 40 million people in slavery around the world right now. A quarter of them are children. Two million of those children are sold for sex. The others are sold for things like forced labor, organ harvesting, child sacrifice, which we've done some cases with as well. And we're working all over the world. We're in 28 countries. Um, we're in 28 states here in the US. And, you know, if you would have told me a couple of years ago that sex trafficking existed, um, you know, I, I was new to it. Right. Yeah. And I, I you know, you, you think you kind of understand the concept. This is something that happens. It, it's probably happening overseas in some third world country. Uh, what I've learned since joining this organization, since following OUR is that uh, the prevalence of it in the U S the U S is the highest demand for child pornography out of any other country in the world. And so, you know, more than 30% of the work that we do is actually right here in the U.S., partnering, law enfor partnering with law enforcement, setting up sting operations, you know, uh, facilitating arrest of these individuals who are harming children, trafficking them, exploiting them. Uh, and then we have another team that's dedicated to actually liberating those children from that situation where they're put into aftercare and we can support their needs to make sure that they get on their healing journey. You know, one of the interesting things as I started to educate myself around this, and I have to admit, I heard this third party. I heard about Tim Ballard and his effort and what he's doing. And then I looked up some videos and I looked up the website and I was listening to him talk about things. And, and one of the things that he mentioned was that because it is such a dark topic that people kind of shy away from it. Like they don't, you know, it's like they hear it, they know that it's happening, but because it's so dark and people instantly start picturing their own kids that they just don't get involved. Can you talk about that a little bit and what you guys are doing to overcome that? Yeah, well, you know, OUR, we, we aspire to, to be a hope for these children. In fact, the phrase that keeps coming back to me over and over again is, is hope for the future. And, um, you know, Tim will say it this way, that if we have to lose our innocence just a little bit in order to actually provide uh, rescue for a child who's living in hell on earth, I mean, you know, this is the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the history of the world. It surpassed just blows the, my mind. Yeah, it surpassed the, the the gun trade. It surpassed the drug trade. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe you've 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 heard of, of those stats before. And we get asked this question all the time: Why why is it so prevalent, and why does it grow so quickly? And the reason is is that you can you can sell a bag of cocaine once. You can sell a child five to ten times a day for years, however long they're in captivity. And, and so when we start framing our mind around that reality, you start to think that, yes, this is hard to listen to, but that is a fraction of the, of the trauma and the darkness that these children are experiencing. So if we can lose our innocence a little bit, just, just to really like actually take a look at the issue. I mean, and you're right, David, like we have, we have, um, sorry to tell you this now after we already started our, our podcast here, but we have subjective, uh, you know, stats that say that when, whenever we come on and talk on shows like this radio shows yeah. that uh, listenership actually decreases. And, and, and listen, I understand. I, I, uh, you know, I have grace for that, but at the same time, 
um, the urgency that we feel as an organization because the things we're encountering day in and day out uh, and what these, these survivors are actually experiencing, the urgency of that far outweighs the uncomfortability of, of you know, talking about the issue. Oh, I totally agree. And, yeah. and I, I, when he, when Tim said that, when he explained why people kind of move away from the topic, I got it. Like it made sense. I've got four kids. I can't imagine visualizing that. Um, especially when you get into some of the more graphic statistics of how many times a day or over a four or five year period, these boys and girls are, are actually raped. But you mentioned something that's very interesting. So if we look at this uh, uh, specifically from a business venture for the people that are selling these children. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons that it makes it so appealing to them is because they can sell it. It's a reusable product, so to speak, in their mind, and they can sell it over and over and over again. Like you said, a bag of cocaine, they sell it once, mm-hmm. then they have to they have to replenish that supply. And with these kids, it's a it's a constant income source for them, and that's that's the reason why it's growing so rapidly and so fast yeah yeah i mean it's it, it's um you know and actually i'm, I'm sorry I, I i don't this doesn't normally happen to me <clears throat> but as you were as you were explaining that back to me I, that i felt the anger rising in myself a little bit when i'm just thinking about the uh the mentality that these traffickers have uh, you know, treating these children and, and women and others like commodities. I mean, it literally is just a, a product that they can move from one place to another, um, that they can coerce and manipulate. And in some cases, uh, with, with, you know, abusive force, um, make these people, you know, do these things. And, and absolutely. And, and, you know, the question that we ask ourselves all the time, because I think what you're uh, perhaps alluding to is is why is why is this um, so needed? Why do we have to have two million children around the world stuck in bondage? And the reality is is that statistic that I gave you earlier is is the demand is that there f- for some reason uh, in this earth we've allowed ourselves to have a demand for 2 million children that are in sex slavery to feed the addiction of people who would, who want to yeah. harm kids in that way. And, and it's growing, it's growing faster and faster. Do we, do we have any idea why it's that is growing? Because it definitely occurred to me when I first heard it. Well, it's not just the, the people that are taking advantage of the business. The business couldn't exist if this demand didn't exist. Mm-hmm. And the United States is the number one generator and consumer of child pornography, if I understand that correctly. Yeah, so 85% of trafficking cases actually start online. So I think the sort of the low hanging fruit to your answer, it's a very complex industry, obviously, which is one of the reasons why, uh, you know, at times organizations like ours and law enforcement agencies feel two steps behind, but we're in a digital age. And, uh, you know, the, the access to these things has become easier and easier. Uh, somebody can sit in a, in a very small, dark basement and distribute child pornography all over the world if, 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 um, if they so desire. And so the ability to, um, to exploit people online and digitally is growing. And also, you know, different, different apps, you know, encrypted messaging and things like that. Uh, by the way, we I haven't mentioned this yet, but we have technologies that combat all of these things, which is why we're so educated on it. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's apps out there, messaging apps, encrypted apps that just allow uh, these traffickers particularly to prey on vulnerable teens and, and people in, you know, that, that are perhaps uh, too, too naive to understand that they're being manipulated or, or coerced. Uh, and that's the main type of uh, trafficking that we see here in the U.S. is, is those, those fake relationships or fake job opportunities that actually start online. So there's another statistic that, that really just blew my mind, because like I said, I was totally uneducated about this, and I'm still not educated. I'm learning. I'm trying to get up to speed. That there are more human slaves today than all the years that the Atlantic slave trade was actually in operation. Is that, do I have that correct? So, um, you know, I, I, uh, I'm embarrassed to say that I haven't, I haven't a hundred percent verified that statistic statistic, but I, I, from people that, that are uh, very close to the issue, uh, that, yeah, that that's what they're telling me. And, yeah. and it sounds like that's what they're telling you as well. 
And, um, you know, in the US, we love to say that we eradicated slavery and that may be the case in policy and in law, but it's certainly not the reality when you, when you, when you really understand the amount of trafficking that's happening. There's, there's federal resources out there. Uh, Polaris puts out a, a really great um, heat map that actually indicates the, the high volume areas for trafficking in the US. And, and I wish that in this conversation, I could just identify 12 cities or something to you. But the reality is, is that when you look at this heat map and you see the volume of people that are being moved from one place to another for, for sexual exploitation, it's really any major city with two interstate highways. That, that, okay, that's wild. So let's talk about some of the reasons that, that this happens. My understanding is that we have sex, labor, organ harvesting, and then you added one that I hadn't heard yet was, was child sacrifice. Is that something new that you guys are learning about or is it just hasn't been talked about much? It's not, it's not new uh, to us as an organization and um, it, it's not, it's not necessarily our core focus, but, but really at the end of the day, we, we want to eradicate anyone who's, who's at risk uh, for being trafficked at risk for, for being in bondage or, or in slavery. And so we do come across these cases from time to time. Yeah. And there are certain areas world where um, whether it's for purposes, uh, in many cases, it's not, it's not solely a religious purpose. There is a business aspect to it as well. So perhaps really? the sacrifice happens and then there's, there's organs that are harvested out of that situation. And so okay. um, it, it's, uh, it, this is, you know, um, I, I don't even like to get too deep into this, this topic because it, it, it just makes your stomach turn when you think about it. Uh, but, you know, we, we're focused on rescuing children who are, who are at risk or in harm's way of any of those things. Given that this is that this is such a dark topic, I mean, it, I think it takes a unique person for this to tug on their heartstrings enough to get involved. How did you get involved with, with OUR? Okay, so um, I I can't take any credit for this. It, it's like you know, it's like getting hit in the face with a two by four. That's that's how I would describe it. Um, you know, I was I was browsing through Amazon Prime one night looking for a new documentary to watch. Uh, OUR has a documentary. It's now on YouTube as well. It's it's uh, you can so you can watch it for free. It's called Operation Toussaint. Uh, I didn't have any friends, David, that that tipped me off. I didn't know anyone in the organization. Uh, I just have I saw you know some description about undercover operators and that that uh, you know caught my attention. And so I watched this documentary. Now looking back, you know, two three years later, whatever it's been now. I can say that it just totally changed the trajectory of my life. I mean, I tell people that my hands were on fire. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't shake this issue. And I've never worked in nonprofit. You know, I, I was, I'm not some social activist like, like a lot of great folks out there are. But I was so compelled by this issue. Uh, I was like, I have to do something. I mean, we started, my wife and I, we started uh, hot chocolate and lemonade stands in our neighborhood just so we could talk to people about this issue and, wow. and make them aware that this is actually happening in our community. Um, and so I followed OUR and, uh, you know, got connected with some folks and, and, uh, and here we are. You know, that, that's very much the kind of reaction that I had. I literally started crying when I started hearing the first time I started hearing about it and I thought I need to do something. And I, and I brought my team together uh, in my company. And I said, listen, we're going to commit to a certain amount of money every month to this organization. And my goal is to continue to increase it uh, until the, till the problem is eradicated. Because one of the things that I heard Tim say was that this is actually a solvable problem. Like we could actually stop this. And I thought that that was extremely encouraging because there's so many different charities that exist out there where you know you're going to help the people that 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 get the benefit of those charities, but the problem's probably not going to be eradicated. And this is one that actually could be could be stopped. Um, I'm curious though about this. The is there something? Well, first of all, let's talk about this. It's actually quite expensive to rescue these kids, is it not? Could you talk about that a little bit? Because I was surprised at the numbers myself. Sure. Yeah. So, and 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 everything's a little bit different, right? I mean, it depends on what sure. what area of the the world you're working in. If you're working domestic versus international, um, and, and I, I kind of want to get back to your 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 earlier point about about solving the problem, actually combating this issue. Yeah. 
Um, so Tim spent about 12 years in the Department of Homeland Security. He was a special operative there. He moved very quickly over into this, at the, in those days, this new uh, unit focused on internet crimes against children, where he was going to be an undercover operator and infiltrate sex trafficking rings, you know, act like the bad guy, uh, you know, dye your hair and wear the disguise. I mean, all of that, right? Like we see in the movies. Uh, that was literally his role. And, and he did have a successful career there. The issue was, is that he, he kept running into situations, particularly internationally, where he'd have jurisdictional restrictions. So it became this unacceptable reality that he knew where these kids were internationally. I mean, he knew they were being sold for sex, but because there was no U.S. connection or, or nexus to the case, he wasn't able to garner resources to go after these kids. Okay. And so he envisioned this public-private model where you have an organization, a non-governmental organization, an NGO like, like Operation Underground Railroad that could actually work fluidly across country lines, across state lines, and supplement law enforcement in those areas. And so when Tim talks about this being a solvable issue, you know, there's many different entities and organizations that combat this issue, and, and, and we're one of them. But we do have a unique expertise. I mean, Tim spent all those years literally developing SOPs and best practices for how to rescue these children, how to liberate them, and then facilitate arrest of the individuals that are harming them. So the investigation process, how you gather evidence, how you, how you bring these things to court, those are all things that Tim literally had to to learn uh, and implement. And that's expertise that, that we take and we now work with you know, hundreds of operators and current and, and, and ex-law enforcement when we're running these operations. And so we're able to supplement all of these different organizations around the world, show them how to conduct these sting operations, provide them with technology and resources to, to do that. And the goal is empowerment. It's actually one of the pillars of OUR. And, and if we can, if we can get into enough places and teach them how to combat this issue, then yes, we can start tipping the scales on this issue. Um, but obviously that, that takes resources, that takes the right relationships, uh, that takes years sometimes to develop, sure. you know, working in an area and providing that aftercare. Um, and then it also takes all the other pieces too, right? I mean, our operators will tell you that, that, um, that liberation is, is, is sometimes the easy part. It's actually the aftercare. So, you know, getting these people back to neutral, you know, uh, Tim met with a, a, neuro, a neuroscientist some years ago, wanting to understand what, what was happening to the brain when children were experiencing this trauma. And he put up two charts. He put a chart of somebody who'd been in a car accident and a chart of somebody who, who'd been trafficked. And the results were the same. I mean, you know, at, at the chemical level, mm -hmm. you're experiencing incredible trauma. And so it can take years to, to rehab and refacilitate that. Uh, and, then, and then you start thinking about, you know, um, the demand side of that, but also the fact that when, when people are abused in that way, um, you know, there's a high prevalence of people that become uh, abusers themselves. And so, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's going to take an effort, uh, sure. a significant effort and, and significant resources to make a difference. But, you know, seemingly OUR and other organizations that we partner with, we have an avenue towards success where we can actually start tipping the scales on this and we can see these rates going down instead of going up. And you guys also work in the rehabilitation correct? Aftercare. Yeah. Aftercare yeah, is a aftercare. part of what we do. More than 50% of our resources go towards aftercare. Uh, we have an amazing aftercare team. They, they literally travel all the time, visiting all of our survivors all over the world, all the aftercare homes that we partner with. We're providing things like food, clothing, shelter, counseling resources, rehabilitation services, anything that these kids and women are going to need uh, to get on their healing journey. And, and, you know, not just survive, but thrive and, and live the life that they're entitled to. That is was, that, that ultimately, or is the idea ultimately to place these children with then a healthy family at some point? Because I would imagine Absolutely. it's going to be difficult to track the original parent down. Yeah. So, so and, and fortunately, you know, th there's a prevalence of, of family members being involved in these cases as well, which is horrific to, to understand. Um, you know, we worked cases where, where mothers and fathers have trafficked their own children. 
Um, and in that situation, obviously, it's, it wouldn't be healthy for a child to go back in that environment. So uh, we try to reunify with a family member when that's possible. If it's not possible, that's when we partner with aftercare homes. And then absolutely. And in fact, um, spoiler alert, I mean, still go watch this documentary for sure. But uh, one of the f- two of the first you know, group of children that we rescued, Tim Ballard, ended up adopting. And that process took three years for him adopt- to adopt those children. And through that process, we learned a lot about some of the shortfalls that families go to because there are plenty of families with the heart to adopt yeah. survivors. Uh, but there's so much paperwork and red tape and things that you're you know, getting visas and things you have to go through. And so because of that process, Tim and his wife, Catherine, actually established a, a part, a, another segment of our aftercare called Children Need Families. You may not know that, David. No. And we actually uh, we actually help families of survivors to uh, to get those survivors placed in those homes so that they do have a forever home. And absolutely, that's the goal. That's amazing. Is it, do, do, let me see if I understand this part correctly, because this is, this is something else that kind of floored me. Uh, but then when I started thinking about it, I could kind of see how this would occur. It, I don't know if it was in the documentary or in some speech that I saw Tim giving where he was talking about how some of these families in other countries are actually tricked into selling their children to these traffickers that will then put them in sex slavery, but the parents don't know that that's actually what's going to happen to them. Is that, could you talk about that a little bit? So there, there's one particular case that comes to mind when you say that, and there was a, a beauty queen. Uh, this is horrible. There was a beauty queen that was nationally known. She's a nationally known person in, in the country that we were operating in. And she was literally recruiting children going to home to home and telling their parents that we're going to take these kids and we're going to, uh, you know, make them models and actresses and actors and things like that. Um, and they set up this whole studio where they could come and have glamour shots taken. Um, and what was actually happening is that they were taking these kids to an island and, and trafficking them for years. And we were able to capture this person. She, she's faced charges for, uh, for her, her assault on these children. And, and we were able to liberate over 100 kids on, on, that, on that campaign that were all in, in that similar situation. So absolutely it happens. And in fact, just yesterday, I'll be brief here, David, but just yesterday I had a, an amazing opportunity to meet with 10 survivors um, that are they're young adults now. Uh, many of them ha- have their own children who, who they, they haven't seen in, in years. They were tricked into job offers. And that happens a lot too, uh, where, hey, we have this amazing job opportunity in this other country. And because of macroeconomic situations or what have you, people are willing to travel for work so that they can feed their family. And so if it seems like a legitimate job opportunity, they'll, they'll you know, get to this next country. As soon as they get there, the traffickers will take their passports and they have no way of returning to their country and, and they'll, they'll be trafficked. And we were able to rescue uh, several survivors that were literally in one of the worst, uh, worst imaginable places. I mean, if you could imagine, you know, literal jail cells that they're, they're in and, yeah. and for years and being trafficked and we were able to rescue them and, and now they're on their, their aftercare journey. So these are the types of situations that we encounter all the time. And, and by the way, these women, you know, sometimes people think that, that, you know, only the most vulnerable find themselves in situations like these, but these are, these were educated individuals. Uh, many of them had degrees. Really? They were just, they were just desperate for work and responded to the wrong job ad. And they found themselves in that situation. And now they've been separated from their kids for, for years and, and not to mention years before that traffic. So it's, it's just horrific what, what's happening. Um, but that's why organizations like OUR exist so that we can, we can provide them hope. And, and we're, we, we have many gov- governmental relationships now where we can work on visas and work on people, getting people returned home back to their home countries so they can see their families. And uh, these, these are all elements that, that we're a part of. That's amazing. So how can, how can the average person get involved, support, keep an eye out, like all of those things, what can we do? Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that question because I was asking myself that question, you know, not, not a few years ago. Um, you know, the, the, the challenging answer, the one that I usually give initially though, is, is to kind of uh, ha- really ask someone to, to think about that. What, what is my skill set? What is my network? What is my influence? You know, who can I talk to about this? That's always the first step. Uh, we do have some resources on our website. You can follow us on social media at OUR Rescue. There's a tab on our site that allows people to get trained. 
and know the signs of trafficking. So our leadership will actually walk you through identifying the signs of trafficking in your area. I kid you not, I just got an email yesterday of a group that I was speaking to in a similar setting to where I'm speaking to you right now. Okay. Um, and they, they uh, encourage their employees to take that training, right? Uh, one individual who took the training, not a few days later, identified a trafficking situation and notified the police. I mean, it was, it was, it, it's incredible. And so, um, so yes, absolutely. Even if I'm not law enforcement trained or military trained, so th- there is a place for you. Um, j- just start by getting trained. Uh, you'll, you'll go through that. It's not very long. It's a training. You get a certificate that says you got trained and then sign up as a volunteer on our site. We have teams all over the country. We have uh, teams in, in, I think, near uh, nearly 100 cities now with team leads that can get you activated in your area with, with fundraiser opportunities, speaking engagements, uh, putting on events, you know, just anything we can do to raise awareness, host screenings of our documentary. Um, there's lots of opportunities for folks to get involved in, and I encourage you guys just to check that out on our website. Okay, so, and, and tell us again, uh, where can they get the documentary? Where can they see that? Yeah. Okay. It's on YouTube operation Tucson. That's T O U S S A I N T. Okay, great. Perfect. And do what, and tell me the website again. O U R rescue.org. O U R rescue.org. Yeah, right right okay. here on the hat. O U R rescue. Nice. Dot, dot org. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. You know, um, Gary, I want to really thank you for being, for being on the show with me today. And, and a lot of people are going to hear this. I'm going to talk about it in live events that I do. I talk to people all over the world. So I'm going to do the best that I can to, to spread this message and uh, congratulations for your courage to, to, to step up and do something about it because I mean, people just need to know that this is going on in the, I mean, it's one of the most horrific things I cannot imagine uh, how children even be remotely begin to live or survive through something like this. So I just want to thank you. Thank, thank yeah. you so much for coming on and talking about it. I really appreciate you. Absolutely. Let's do it again, David. Thanks for your time. You bet. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>